Twombly's. You can see that the Twombly's is much brighter. Now, landscape fabric, when I've talked about it in my garden before, in this back area, it's been pretty controversial. So this one's gonna be a little tricky just because how long this bed is. It's about 50 to 60 feet long. Today we're gonna work on an area of the garden that I don't show often on my channel, my hillside mixed shrub entry border. Hi, it's Steph. Welcome back to my garden. This space that you're looking at here is what I like to call my hillside garden. And it's sort of where my lawn ends and it drops off into a hillside of what was a pretty gnarly, weedy woodland area. So I was able to get that under control with some uh, commercial grade landscape fabric and planting some ground covers, some evergreen ground covers. And now as we come up the hillside, I would love to have a mixed tree and shrub border, which is what I've already started to work on. You can see that I have my first layer planted here. There are a couple of things that I'm I'm going to swap out and I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with that. Um, but ultimately today's goal is to get a couple more things planted and start on the second layer of this mixed tree and shrub border. You can see that I have some edging stones kind of placed here and the reason that these were placed here is just to help kind of delineate where our shrubs were planted for George to easily mow the grass and to be able to weed whack in and around the shrubs. But today we are going to bring out a garden hose and start playing with lines and curves for this border. Now it is a pretty long border, but I think it would be pretty boring to have a straight line. So we're going to play with some curves and kind of see what we can come up with. So that is the goal for today, to bring out this mixture of border quite a bit, to work on the curves of the border, and to plant some really cool trees and shrubs. To give you some context on how this project started, I'm gonna insert some footage here so that you can see where we were and where we last left off. So as you leave my vegetable garden, there is this spot that kind of leads up to the yard and to where my home is. And over the last couple of years, I've been working on cleaning out this spot because this was run over with weeds and pretty obnoxious weeds too. I had some pokeweed, mugwort, and a bunch of other random like native or invasive, I should say, grasses. Things that just looked really wild and unruly. So as we've been working on cleaning this space up, we've been adding some heavy duty landscape fabric to suppress the weeds. And over time, my goal is to have some ground covers coming down this hillside, as well as a mixed shrub border as you head up into the yard. So along there, I plan on having a mixed shrub border. So for now, I've started to plant some junipers and I have this um, juniper sea green that's pretty drought resistant and deer proof. So it is great for this area. I picked these up on clearance at the end of the season last year. And I have one there and one on the other side. I've also planted a bunch of these Bar Harbor junipers that are ground cover. I have about nine of these planted. I have one up there, here, here, here. And these are great shrubs for living ground cover. They are evergreen. They're also drought resistant, pretty deer resistant, and they are great for erosion. So if you have a hillside difficult area to plant and you want to do some kind of evergreen ground cover, this Bar Harbor juniper with this blue gray foliage is a really great plant to look into. So taking you back to the other side, you can see that we've been collecting rocks too. So anytime I dig up rocks from the garden, I have been placing them here. So eventually this whole slope area will be rocks and ground cover evergreens. And then the shrubs as you get into the border of the yard. So we all have these less than perfect areas that we're working on. I have a five year plan for this area of the garden. So slowly we'll get it done. We are currently on year two. We got worms. Oh, and we have worms. So this well, is a great, good. yeah, it's very good. This is a sign of healthy soil. So this is where I'm going to put my Rose of Sharon. So the area is not aesthetically gorgeous at the moment. You know, obviously it's just a hole in some black landscape fabric, but like I said, I have a five-year plan for this area. So eventually I will have shrub, tree or shrub, evergreen shrubs, rocks. It'll look really pretty. I can see it over time. This will all be landscaped, this hillside, and then the border as you head up into the yard. So all in all, I think it's gonna look great. So let's go ahead and get this Rose of Sharon planted. And here's the Rose of Sharon that we planted. It just finished blooming a few weeks ago and it's doing great. 
And right over here by the rock, I had a fig tree planted. It was here for a couple of seasons. It never gave me any figs. I got sick of it. I thought that I could plant something I'll like a lot better in this spot. So I dug it up and gave it away. So that has now opened up a new space for something new to go in this season. And I also transplanted this here. This is a Miss Kim lilac. It's pretty compact, only getting to be three to five feet tall and wide. So I thought this was a really nice lilac to kind of add in this space. And all of the things that I had planted over the last year look really great. Here is an update on the sea green junipers. Junipers are really drought tolerant, so they do well in hillside areas like this that are really well draining. And even my Barhar junipers are really filling in nicely and starting to crawl and cover some of this landscape fabric. When we're starting a new bed project, we always like to outline the shape of it with an old garden hose to kind of give us an idea of how it's going to flow before we even get a shovel into the soil. So this one's going to be a little tricky just because how long this bed is. It's about 50 to 60 feet long and I don't really want to go too deep into the yard because grass is much easier to maintain for me than beds. We, we could debate on that actually. Yes, we but, could. Yep. So um, we want to have a little bit of movement, but we also don't want this bed to be so deep that we're cutting in, you know, 15 feet. Right. So it's, it's a balancing act. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to go, but this is why you use a hose because it's trial and error. You can just kind of keep playing with the shape until you feel like it's a good one. Here's what I do know. This blue spruce is going to go in this area. In a couple of videos back, I had talked about how I wanted it in the Japanese maple garden. It is called a Salem blue spruce, but because I'm not quite sure how big it's going to get, I think it would be better suited for this area. Plus we don't have any blue shrubs here yet. So I thought this was gonna be a good first blue shrub. So we are bumping it out. You can see we're trying to make a curve as to where this blue spruce is going to land. So There's we know also for sure. a sprinkler head right there. Yes, we did. George went ahead and put some flags um, where our sprinkler heads come up so that we have an idea of what we're working with. We just don't want to plant anything directly in front of the sprinkler head. Right. Um, this blue spruce being at that, that spot, it shouldn't really interfere too much with the spray pattern. So it's good to just mark out your sprinkler heads just so you know where they are. Right. So there's one curve. And we're kind of like reverse engineering this. Now, do you want anything over here? Like yes. if, if there's another shrub. So there is a yellow shrub that we're going to be moving. We're going to do an old fall switch, switcheroo on it. Um, it is an Osario's Gold Umbrella Pine that we planted last season, I believe. Was it last season, George? It might have been the season before. But no, last season. Last fall at some point or in, even in the spring. I can't quite remember. Everything starts to See, kind of... I'm, I'm already I'm already in two humps right now. Like, is this just going to be like a roller coaster? Like, whoa. <laughs> And it's not looking, easy. It's not easy. It's not right. straight is easy. Straight is easy, but yeah. it's just not as visually appealing. And down the side of our foundation, we have a straight line and it's not terrible, but I don't love it. Uh, but it's what we're working with for now. But in this space, I definitely wanted some shape. All right, we're going to keep working on this and see what we come up with. And I'll show you that shrub that I'm going to move to this space here. It's still early, so it's a bit shady over here, but this is the Osario's Gold Umbrella Pine. It is a golden tipped umbrella pine that is pretty dwarf in size. It only gets to be about six feet in height and three feet in width over a 10 year period. So the back of it, you can see, is looking a little bit flat and that is because it's not getting enough sun. So we're gonna move it out of this area, try to dig up a good amount of the root ball and put it in that mixed shrub border there. Oh, it's looking good, George. Thanks. Yeah, I think this first one, I'm deliberately making it a little shallower than the next one, just so that these bump outs uh, have a little bit of difference and they're not so um, uniform. But I think I can probably do one more bump out towards the end of the, the, the bed and we should be okay. Yes, yeah, so we'll have like three curves all together. Three or, curves, or yeah. Or three kind of what we call bellies, right? Right. Popping out. Yeah. So this is a Salem right and we couldn't find too much information online although Hassan the dealer we purchased this from he deals with Japanese maples and conifers so typically he only sells things that are going to be in like the dwarf Category, range yeah. so he said the parent plant to this was about six feet tall but if it does get bigger than me I'm just going to chop off the leader let it get wide because it can get as wide as it wants here um, but I don't want it to get too tall because I don't want it to shade the vegetable garden, right? Yeah, and we put so. it, we are going to plant it off center so that you can still see the other conifers behind. So I think this is going to look great because we have that sunny swirl hinoki, which is green with a little bit of yellow. This blue spruce here, 
the Taylor Sunburst Pine, and we have that there, which is a royal purple smoke bush. And then another Hinoki, and then the golden Osorio's Pine right there. Check it out, a little garden snake. Ah, See? yuck. The kids would love this. Yeah, they would. How about it's, you? No, no, get away, <laughs> yuck. So I'm using these pavers to basically outline what I've done with the hose because my hose isn't that long. I'll pull the hose down once I have these pavers all in place. Then I'll buzz this all down with my weed whacker and then the landscape fabric, which I know everybody loves on the internet. But we're using the landscape fabric for a specific purpose, right? We're not going to plant any flowers. I don't have any landscape fabric anywhere in my garden. Yep. This is the only space, this hillside area in the backwoods area that I've explained before. The reason why is because we have some really noxious um, and gnarly weeds. But in this particular area, because it's just going to be a mixed tree and shrub border, and no perennial planting, we want to keep the maintenance really low in this space. Yeah. Oh, the curves are looking so good. After George placed the stone, you can kind of see it even, well, you can see it a lot better than with the hose, right? So now we're getting a better idea yeah. for how things are looking. And like I said, my hose is a little short. So what I'm doing is I'm now pulling the hose and going to make this last, this last belly. And we should be good to get to that last shrub. Yep. This is the, la this is the end of the row here, the end of the bed. This is a lilac that I'm actually going to pull out because um, it's supposed to be a reblooming lilac, but it doesn't rebloom very well for me. So I am actually going to plant a native tree in this corner that I'm really excited about. While we're working in this back garden space, I remembered I wanted to show you something. I'm going to grab a leaf from this Fire Glow Japanese maple and I want to go ahead and show you another tree. Here's where we're working on the mixed shrub border and right across the way here, we just recently planted a new Japanese maple and this is the Twombly's Red Sentinel. Now, originally we had a different tree here. Last fall during our fall switcheroo video, we planted a burgundy lace Japanese maple and the burgundy lace had burgundy foliage or really dark foliage. And it didn't really stand out against all of the foliage in the woods here, the green and whatnot. It kind of got lost. So we knew that we wanted something brighter red in this space. So what we did was we posted the burgundy lace Japanese maple on Facebook marketplace. And within a few hours we had a buyer. So once we knew that we had secured a buyer, we went ahead and we dug it up. And then we planted this Japanese maple here that we recently picked up at Tolan garden in Connecticut when we went up to visit Hassan. Now the Twombly's red Sentinel is a really great columnar shaped Japanese maple. It is also very dense. So this makes a great tree for a corner, whether you're planting it in the corner of your house or the corner of a foundation. So this is a really pretty one. It also holds on to its leaves a lot longer than some of the other Japanese maples in the fall. So it's one of the last ones to lose its foliage, which I thought was really interesting. So we planted it here and I think it's really beautiful. And you can see the difference in the foliage color. This is the fire glow Japanese maple that we had planted there in the Japanese maple garden. And here is the foliage on the fire glow on the Twombly's. You can see that the Twombly's is much brighter. George is done with placing the edging stones on our border here. And I think it turned out really nicely. I'm really happy with the gradual shape of things. And we were really fortunate that we have a stockpile of these edging stones behind our shed. Because over the last couple of seasons, we have been replacing all of these that we had around our tree rings and borders with reclaimed cobblestone, which we really love. And so because we had all of these left over, they were the perfect stone to use to edge this bed to kind of get an idea for things. So now I really like the shape of it and the next next step, which George had to do, was go ahead and buzz down all of this grass to get it really low so that we could put down the landscape fabric. Now, these edging stones are also going to be helpful in weighing down that landscape fabric and keeping it in place. There is so much room over here for activities. I am so excited to have all this extra planting space. Now, of course, I have learned over the years that you can't overcrowd things and these shrubs and trees are going to grow. So I have to give them ample space. So I am going to plant what I have now and it might look like there's a a lot of uh, negative space or blank space but that's on purpose because we need to allow for room for growth and also space for me to be able to bring something home and plant it if I find something I love. Let's talk about the plants. So this here is a bloomerang lilac. It doesn't really rebloom that well and I'm just tired of it. So this is coming out and I'm going to replace it with a native tree to the Northeast. This is a fringe tree and it gets beautiful fall color. Look at this yellow foliage. 
It's looking stunning at the moment. So I think it's gonna stand out really nicely in this spot. Here is the information on this tree. I purchased it this spring. It gets these really beautiful white flowers. I believe that happens in late spring, early summer. It gets to be 20, 12 to 20 feet in height and it needs 12 to 20 feet spacing. So I think it'll be a great anchor in this corner. It is hardy down to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit and it likes full sun. So this will be a perfect spot for it. And something that you all have been telling me that I've needed for a couple of years and I haven't gotten one yet, but I did now, this is a root slayer shovel. And because this shrub has been here for a few years, it's going to be pretty rooted in and difficult to remove. So I thought, what time is better than now to pick up one of these root slayers? So let's go ahead and put it to the test. This shrub was really rooted in. And what I noticed with this root slayer shovel is that when I went ahead and I stepped into it, into the soil, I could feel it biting and cutting through the roots with this serrated edge. So that was a lot different than a traditional shovel. So I was really happy with it. It worked well. It took me about two minutes to get this shrub out of the ground. And sometimes you don't know that you need a tool until you actually use it. So this, I would say, worked well. To plant all of these shrubs, I'm going to use the same process. I'm going to dig my hole. I'm going to use some of the native soil mixed with some of my favorite compost. This is the Coast of Maine organic compost, the Bar Harbor blend, which is composed of lobster and crab shell. Great stuff. I'm also going to add a little bit of startup fertilizer to get the roots really going and growing. And this is the Espoma Biotone fertilizer. And then I'm just going to go ahead and pack it into the hole and water it in. So I'm going to do all of that and then I will show you what things look like. We are all done with our planting and now it is time to put down the landscape fabric. Now landscape fabric, when I've talked about it in my garden before in this back area, it's been pretty controversial. Now let me just reiterate that I don't use landscape fabric in any of my planting beds with the exception of this really gnarly back woodland area because we have such noxious weeds. And over the last seven years, it has done a wonderful job of keeping all of those weeds at bay. So because this bed here is going to be just a mixed shrub and tree border, I have opted to use landscape fabric here as well because I want it to be super low maintenance and I don't want to do any work in this bed whatsoever. So I am going to use this DeWitt Pro 5 Weed Barrier. It lets water in so it's permeable, air and nutrients get through, and in the areas that I don't have any mulch or anything on it, it has been really UV resistant. So it has not broken down, which has been great. And so today we're gonna to use that here. If you do have a need for landscape fabric, I buy it on Amazon with my own money. I'm not sponsored. I can put the link down below. The size that we buy is the 250 foot length by five foot width. And we like that size because it was more affordable to get it in bulk like this, but also because we wanna have minimal seams because the more seams you have, the more places that weeds can push through. It is about 5 p.m. now and we started, I want to say about 8.30 or so this morning. So it's taken us all day and we still have maybe a third of this stretch to finish covering up. But it's going, but like every other project, it usually takes a lot longer than we expected. But we'll keep plugging at it. We're in the home stretch now. We just have this little corner to finish up. But we are losing light quick, so we will have to come back out here in the morning and then... We'll walk you through the plants that we put out and how everything looks. 
it's the next day and we're about to get some rain, but I just want to show you how things worked out. Um, we did get everything finished with the exception of some mulch, which we'll likely get next spring. But here is that fringe tree that I planted. Now, currently it looks more like a shrub and it can be grown as a large shrub or a small multi-trunk tree. So the goal with this is as it grows, I will start limbing it up into a multi-trunk tree. And I think this is going to be really great in this corner. The next thing that I planted was a nine bark, and this is the beautiful ginger wine nine bark by Proven Winners. And this nine bark has a really beautiful orangey red foliage. It is gorgeous. I really love the look of something dark, especially with some gold foliage evergreens. I think the contrast looks really lovely. And you can see it has really large foliage. In the late spring, early summer, it'll get these clusters of white blooms. And even in the winter, when this shrub loses its foliage, because it is deciduous, it has appealing bark. Let me show you the next thing that I'm really happy about. It's this blue evergreen here. This is a Salem blue spruce. And originally I wanted to plant it at the end of our Japanese maple garden, but because I'm a little wary of the sizes on blue spruces, I decided that we would plant it here. And I don't have any blue evergreens in this area, so I think this was a great choice for this spot. And it rounds out this trio of evergreens that I have here. So I'm really happy with the placement of this. I think it's really beautiful. Coming along to the end here is the last shrub that we planted in this space. And it was transplanted from another spot in the garden, from our Japanese maple garden. And this is an umbrella pine. It is a dwarf variety. It's called the Osario's Gold. And it gets to be about six feet in height and three feet in width in a 10 year period. Now I do have a hydrangea right behind it. This is a quick fire, which is beautiful. And I had purchased on clearance several years ago. It likely will have to get moved out of this space, but because I don't want to worry about where I'm going to put it right now, I'm going to leave it put until the spring, and then I will find a new home for it and move it out to give this pine some more room. And one other shrub that I want to mention in this area that I planted last fall is this Seven Suns Flower Temple of Bloom. It bloomed for me for the first time this season in my garden. I just planted it last year and it had these really pretty little white blooms. But even now, as the white blooms have faded, all of the calyxes have this really pretty kind of deep pink red colored, uh, what looks to be like a little flower. So they are gorgeous. This is now a shrub, but again, as it grows, I will be training it into a small multi-trunk tree. But this is a really great long season of interest shrub or tree it will even get some peeling bark in the winter once all of this foliage drops so a really good one to check out for your garden earlier in the video i had talked about how i had a fig tree in this space and how i didn't want it here anymore because it wasn't giving me any figs well this is what i'm going to replace it with this is a popcorn viburnum and it gets to be about eight to ten feet tall and wide so i think it'll fill out the space really nicely and the great thing about this is that it gets these large clusters of white blooms in the spring that almost look like hydrangea blooms so i'm really excited to add this to my garden and it also gets fall foliage color changes so that is what I'm going to plant in this space at some point this week. This was year three out of a five-year plan that I had for this space. And so far this year and this change has made the largest impact. And I'm really happy with the way things are looking. We are going to change out the edging at some point next spring. I'm not sure what we're going to use just yet, but something to think about over the winter. And we also need to add some mulch. But for now, we'll call it done. And I'm really excited to see how all of these trees and shrubs are going to grow in over time. Thank you so much for spending your time with me and I will catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please hit the thumbs up button and please consider subscribing so you don't miss any of my future videos and we'll see you soon.